This is Mark Depew, and again, I'm with Mr. Newton Minow. Good afternoon, Mr. Minow. Glad to be here, Mark. I'm going to start with this, <clears throat> the question you might not have expected, but you and I had talked about it earlier. You got a very distinctive tie tack you're wearing. Tell me about that tie tack. Uh, this is the PT-109. That was the ship that JFK was on during World War II that was destroyed, and he he rescued uh, some of his crew and brought them to safety. Uh, th this is not, I lost the original. This is a copy, and uh, but I treasure it. Did the original, was that possibly a gift or a connection? It was a gift, and I, uh, uh, my daughter actually got me uh, and, uh, and one of the originals. She, she bought it uh, from a collector, and um, I don't let that out of the house. <laughs> but this is a copy. And I imagine why you don't let that yes. out. One of the advantages of having an interview in the morning and then having lunch is that we get to hear all these stories that don't necessarily come up during the interview. And there's one in particular I wanted to have you share that goes way back into your, your days when you were clerking, and Abner Mikvet was also clerking, and the connection with the, the Brown versus, versus Board of Education case. Well, the term uh, Abner and I were together was the Supreme Court term 1951-1952. Brown versus Board of Education was pending at the Supreme Court. This was the desegregation of the public schools issue. It had been pending there for a while. And it was on the docket, and whenever it came up, the judges would postpone it again. And one of the great experiences of being a law clerk at the Supreme Court, is that every justice met alone with all the law clerks for all nine justices for lunch one day during the term. And Abner Mikva and I uh, both asked Justice Frankfurter the same question, which, is, which was, why is the Brown case being postponed? And Justice Frankfurter said something that shocked us, he looked at us and said, you think we're going to decide that case during an election year, a presidential election year? So it was very blunt that the court paid attention to politics as well uh, as part of history. Especially such an important case like that that was going to affect the entire country. Exactly. And of course, a year or two later, uh, Chief Justice Vinson uh, died. Uh, Chief Justice Warren became the Chief Justice, and he was determined to get a unanimous decision in the Supreme Court. They worked on it and came out, I think, in 54. Had you ever had a consideration of going into a judicial career during your long tenure as a lawyer? Um, I thought about it. At one time in my life, I thought I would like to be an appellate judge, not a trial judge. I never, I, I tried some cases, but not enough to have experience to be a trial judge. But I thought about it, and Senator Percy, when he was uh, an Illinois senator, uh, asked me if I would like to become a federal judge, and he said he would support it. And I thought about it hard. And um, I decided against it, against pursuing it, because I reflected that I had too many outside interests, that I'd li like to be involved in too many things that I would have to say no to if you were on the bench. Outside interests such as? Such as politics, such as universities, uh, such as public broadcasting. I had too many things. Uh, that I was interested in. As a lawyer, what was the, the main focus of your, your experiences? I'm one of the last, I think, of the generalists. Uh, there are not many generalists left, but I have, over the years, done a lot of business law, uh, mergers, acquisitions, corporate law. I've tried cases. Uh, I tried one case for, for a union, the airline pilots 
uh, union. Uh, I've been, done some international work, handled a major building of a new city in Israel. Uh, I uh, have had uh, experience with trusts and estates. Uh, I've handled actually two divorces, which I'll never, <laughs> never do again. Uh, and um, I've counseled families. So I'm one of the last of the lawyers who likes to not specialize. I would imagine, though, with your experience with the FCC, that you dealt with a lot of telecommunications cases. I have, particularly uh, our firm uh, represented AT&T during the antitrust and divestiture period. My partner, Howard Trenens, uh, did that and became general counsel of AT&T. That was in the early 80s. Early 80s. I've also um, represented um, some broadcasters, some cable interests. Uh, I have one, I've, I've tried to stay away from the FCC, but I did have one case I argued there uh, years ago. But my legal career has been building a great firm uh, which is now huge, now 1,900 lawyers. In f we're in Europe, we're in Asia, we're uh, in the United States, and attracting very, very able uh, lawyers and working together as teams. Uh, I've, I've spent a great deal of time representing the First National Bank of Chicago, which today is part of the uh, chase uh, banks. There is a common theme here, or thread, if you look back at what we've been talking about. FCC had to come in and, as a manager, basically fix that institution. Uh, your involvement with Northwestern at a key moment of their, their history of selecting a new president because of management issues. And I think the term you used is somebody who could be a good, strong manager. And now your discussion again as a manager of a law firm. So is that something that you reflected on in terms well, of Well, I've, I've your thought success? a lot about that. I have a fairly short attention span. Uh, I, I, get, I don't like to do a lot of the details. And I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at. And what I'm good at is evaluating people. And I can tell pretty quickly if somebody will be good at a certain task or not. Well, I didn't expect this, but that's the perfect segue into what we want to talk about next, what I want to talk about. And that's your relationship with a young lawyer by the name of Barack Obama. But we're going to go back even a couple steps before that, because I think you were at Sidley Austin at the time, and a young lawyer by the name of Michelle Robinson joined the firm. Tell me about that. We um, had the benefit of Michelle with us for a few years. Michelle is a Chicagoan, <clears throat> very well educated, Princeton, Harvard Law School. She came to us straight out of law school, and she worked in the group, actually, that I was and it was sort of a communications group. We represented advertising agencies, marketing people. And um, Michelle was uh, doing fine work uh, with us. And um, one day, uh, one of my daughters, my middle daughter, Martha, who at that time was a professor, later dean at Harvard Law School. She was a professor, and she called up. And she said, um, and I should say, Martha's been at Harvard since 1981, so that is a long time, more than 30 years. And she's called me about one student, 30 plus years, one student. And she said, uh, Dad, <clears throat> I know your firm doesn't, we have a summer program for law students, summer interns. She said, I know your firm doesn't hire first-year law students who've only finished their first year. She said, but I've got one that is so exceptional. I think you're, and he wants to spend the summer in Chicago. I think you firm should at least think about it. I said, what's his name? 
She said, Barack Obama. And I said, you'll have to spell that for me. I'll call our recruiting bunch and we'll get them interviewed. Well, our recruiting at that time was headed by a lawyer named John Levy. Uh, John was a top lawyer and he was the son of Edward Levy, who had been the president of the University of Chicago, also Attorney General of the United States under President Ford. I called John and I said, um, Martha called, he knew Martha. And he, I said, Martha called about a student that um, she said we should interview. And John said, what's his name? I said, he, I said, well, he's a first year student. His name is Barack Obama. John started to laugh. I said, what are you laughing about? It's not funny. He said, no, we've hired him. He said, he was here this week. We've interviewed him, we fired him. We heard he was exceptional, and he was, and we hired him on the spot. So I said, well, that's fine. I called Martha, I said, I didn't know this. He's already been hired. So Barack came to the firm. And again, just as a summer intern? As a summer intern. And we always assign a, a lawyer in the firm to be sort of a supervisor, mentor. John assigned Michelle, Robinson to be Barack's junior. Uh, I didn't pay too much attention, but I did work with him on one matter, and I found him to be exceptional, just as Martha had predicted. We became friends, and I would take him to lunch occasionally. And one day, Howard Trinan's our Manage, or another, Howard and I were both managing partners at the firm. He was chairman of the firm. We took Barack to lunch, and we urged him to think about becoming a law clerk at the Supreme Court. This was before he was editor-in-chief of the Harvard Law Review. He said he wasn't interested. I said, you're making a mistake. I said, this is an extraordinary experience. And he said... I'm older when I started law school. I'm anxious to get on with my life and my career, and I don't want to do that. So he said no. And then um, he finished the summer with us. One day, my wife, Joe, and I, uh, I guess this was the next summer, we, when they, we, one, one night we went to the theater to see Spike Lee's movie, uh, Do the Right Thing. And we ran into Barack and Michelle. They were out on a date. Michelle was extremely embarrassed. She felt that as supervisor, Barack, she shouldn't be socializing or dating him. I could see she was upset. I said, forget it, have a good time, enjoy it. But then um, Barack left, he came back the next summer by this time, we knew they were dating. We took them to Ravinia. Ravinia is our outdoor Chicago Symphony Orchestra summer venue where the orchestra and a lot of other entertainment during the summer. We took them there. <clears throat> and we uh, saw each other more that summer. And at the end of the summer, uh, Barack came in to see me and he said, um, he was leaving. We had offered him another a, a job for the future. He said he couldn't take the job, and I said, uh, "What's the, why?" He said, "I'm thinking of going into politics." I said, "Well, that's good." I said, uh, "We like to see talented people go into politics. We'll try to help you." And he said, "I don't think you're going to want to help me when I tell you the rest of the story." We were both standing up in my office, and he said, I'd rather you sit down before. And I thought, what the hell is this? So we both sat down. He said, I'm taking Michelle with me. I said, you no good, rotten, worthless piece of it. He said, hold it, we're gonna get married. I said, well, that's different. And then he told me, and then Michelle shortly left. 
um, we kept in touch. Brock then finished law school. Then he became editor in chief of the Harvard Law Review. He became well known. It was a big story about him. In the, so he was always coming back to Sidley Austin as an intern each summer. Yes. <clears throat> And then he cut it short because he had to go back to work on the Law Review. And uh, then he came back to Chicago, and then I started to see that he was interested in politics, and he became a candidate for the state legislature. Now, before you go too much farther, and we'll come back to this, the first time you met him, and you'd already heard about him from your daughter, from your colleagues, that he was an exceptional student. What impressed you about him that first time you met him? He was extraordinarily mature for a young person. Was, I could tell from his demeanor, his judgment. I could see he was intelligent. Uh, but his maturity was the thing that hit me the most. When he decided to run for office, we had a fundraiser for him. My wife and I had it in our apartment, and Barack was a poor candidate. He Poor as in he didn't have the finances or he was not skilled? Both. He didn't have the finances, and he was not skilled. He, uh, I remember very clearly in our living room, he was sitting before, standing before our fireplace, answering questions from potential supporters and donors. And he would give long, academic, involved answers. Uh, on the one hand this, on the one hand that. And um, he was not crisp, not... And so we told him, Brock, you got to get better. Well, he did get better. <clears throat> the more he was exposed, then he got better and better. He was elected. This is this was to the state senate, Illinois State Senate in 1996, something like that, somewhere in there. And uh, then we kept in touch. I would uh, sometimes we, we we'd often have lunch together, and I belonged to the commercial club where they'd have uh, important speakers. I'd invite Barack to come to lunch, and he would come and to the speaker, uh, and. Um, then one day, he told us he decided to run for Congress. He was going to run in the Democratic primary against the incumbent Congressman Bobby Rush. That was 2000. And I said, are you nuts? I said, why are you doing this? And he said, well, I think, I think the, uh, Rush is vulnerable. Uh, he had run for mayor against... Richard M. Daly and lost badly. He said, and I'd like to be in national office in Congress. I said, I think you're making a mistake. <clears throat> I called, I had a number of black clients, including successful businessmen in Chicago, including John Johnson, the owner and publisher of uh, Ebony uh, Magazine. And I'd call a, a number of them. I'd represented a group of them in a cable television enterprise. They could all afford it, and I'd ask them for a contribution for Barack. And I raised exactly zero because they all said the same thing to me. They said, let him wait his turn. Let him wait his turn. Let him wait his turn. He ran and lost very badly. It looked like his political career had hit a abyss. But before you go farther, um, what was the nature of the relationship you had? Because there's a couple times here you've just been talking about, he's come and asked your opinion about some important decisions in his life, not to mention, I would assume, for campaign contributions yes. as well. But and were you a mentor of sorts to him? Sort of. In fact, he, he called me a mentor. I have a picture I treasure in my office picture taken with Abner Mikva and me, I'll come to that, where he calls he calls me a, his wonderful mentor. Um, I was a, sort of an advisor. 
uh, our difference in age. I wasn't a, I was old enough to be his father. And um, uh, I think he looked to me for, as an advisor, helper. Then one day he called me. He said he wanted to have lunch. He told me he had to make a decision about his future, that he had a chance maybe to be head of a major foundation here in Chicago, which would be a good job where he'd have a good salary. I believe that was the Joyce Foundation? I think, he, I think it was the Joyce Foundation. He was already a trustee of that foundation. And uh, Michelle wanted him to do that, that he'd have some stability in his life. He wouldn't be traveling back and forth always to Springfield for the state uh, senate. But he said he also wanted to be a, a senator. And I said, Barack, you are a senator. He said, I don't mean an Illinois state senator. I mean an Illinois United States senator. And um, there was going to be a, a, a vacancy. Peter Fitzgerald was up for re-election. Correct. He was something of a renegade Republican. He decided not to he run. He decided for not to run. Well, I said, Barack, I, I said, have you got any money? He said, no, not a penny. I said, uh, what makes you think uh, you could do this? He said, uh, I believe I could win. I said, Barack, um, the only way black candidates win statewide elections, as proved by what happened with uh, Carol Mosley Braun in Chicago with uh, Harold Washington, is if there's one black candidate and more than one white candidate. Otherwise, you really don't have a chance. I said, will you be the only black candidate? And you're talking about the Democratic primary. Primary. And he said, yes. And I said, well, how do you know that? He said, well, I've checked, and Jesse Jackson is not going to run. Uh, they're going to support me. I don't think Carol Mosley Brown is going to run. I think I'll be the, I believe I'll be the only black candidate. I said, will there be more than one white candidate? He said, there'll be more than two. And uh, I said, are you sure of that? He said, well, I can't swear to it, but I think there'll be a number of, I said, well, at least numerically, you would at least have a chance. Now, what about money? He said, I don't have any. <clears throat> So I tried a couple of friends to become his finance chairman. They all said no. Uh, but he went ahead, and the announcement day came. And I went to it. It was at one of the Chicago hotels. I think there were two white people there. One was David Axelrod, and one was me. The others were all black, including the black politicians, including Emil Jones, other black leaders, and black and Barack announced his candidacy. Everybody who knew anything thought it was foolish. Would it be fair to say at that time he's still a relatively obscure Illinois politician? Absolutely. Not many people knew who he was. Uh, it was like a stranger uh, to most voters. Then... <clears throat> He got lucky. The, he was way behind in the polls, but the leading uh, opponent got in trouble with his ex-wife, and he sunk in the polls, and Barack won the nomination. The, his two main candidates, opposition, were Dan Hines, who was the controller at that time. Right, who was, right, and then an, another, Blair Hall. Blair Hall. Blair Hall is the one who got in trouble with his ex-wife. So Barack won the primary. Then the question is the general election. And there was a very attractive Republican candidate named Ryan, who I had met. He, he was an investment banker in town. And then he got in trouble with his 
Y, X, Y. It's, I'm sorry to keep interrupting here, but it's fair to mention this is Jack Ryan, no relation to George Ryan, the impeached former governor, nor Jim Ryan, the former attorney Correct. general. So, Correct. But he had that Ryan name that didn't help. He sunk in the polls. Then the Republicans did a very foolish thing. They imported a uh, black candidate who was a terrible candidate. I forgot his name. Alan Keyes. Alan Keyes. From Maryland. He was dreadful. And um, in fact, I went with Barack to the one debate that they had at WTTW and uh, sat, I sat right behind Barack. And he was plenty edgy and nervous, but he handled himself very well. And finally, everybody saw that the Republican candidate was a disaster, including most Republicans. And uh, Barack won by a very substantial margin. He had slightly over 70% of the vote. By this time, by the time he had that debate with Alan Keyes, he, wasn't, he was no longer obscure. He was nationally renowned, wasn't he? He was, and he was developing... <clears throat> A reputation as being a unusually successful candidate getting along with even with the other side. Uh, his reputation in the Illinois legislature had won the respect and even the admiration of a number of his Republican colleagues. Did you attend the Democratic convention that year in Boston? No, I didn't, but I watched his speech on television. And I said to myself, the sky's the limit now for Barack. What was it about that speech that is so memorable that a lot of people say launched his political career after that? I think it did. I, I think that speech, more than anything else, was responsible for making him a uh, nationally possible uh, candidate. Now, one thing I want to tell you is that during this period, as he was attracting attention, several people would come to interview me about him. One was an author named David Garrow, G-A-R-R-O-W, who's just written a new book about Barack Obama. Rising star, the making of Barack Obama. Right. And in the course of it, Mr. Garrow said to me, I understand you wrote a letter recommending him for some fellowship, some national fellowship, in which you predicted that he would become the president of the United States. I said, I don't have any recollection of that. And he said, do you keep your correspondence files? Do you keep copies of your letters? And I said, periodically, we give all my files, non-firm files, my personal files, to the Chicago History Museum. My wife is a trustee there, and we're very active with the Chicago History Museum, and they want them. And um, you can go over there and see if you can find it. So he went to the Chicago History Museum, and by God, he finds the letter. And in the letter, which is in his book, uh, I did say this is going to be one of the most important leaders of his generation, and one day he will be either the mayor of Chicago or the governor of Illinois or the senator from Illinois. I did not say he would be the president of the United States. That never crossed my mind that he could become president. You had, but I did see in him, I did see in him the potential to become a very important person. Again, I the, keep going back to this, but what qualities really came out in the forefront when you, when you worked with him? Because by now you've had several years' relationship with him. It seemed to me that he was a grown-up more than anything else and that he was fair he was wise. He had the 
temperament. When he actually, when he started to become a candidate for president, uh, Todd Perdum, who had been a New York Times correspondent, later and today he's uh, a contributing writer for the Wall Street for the Vanity Fair magazine. He came to interviewed me, and he said, "What?" He's asked me the same question you're asking me. He said, well, "What was it about him?" <clears throat> and I said, "I remember when Franklin Roosevelt was elected president, 1932. Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Supreme Court judge, was still alive, and Roosevelt went to see Justice Holmes." And when he left, the press asked Justice Holmes, what did you think? And Holmes said, he's got a first-class temperament and a second-class intellect. And I said, with Barack Obama, you've got a first-class temperament and plus a first-class intellect. He's got those two qualities, a fine mind and a very balanced, wonderful temperament. That's why I think, and, and I, I believe I was right. I think that's what Barack is. At that time, did you have a sense of his politics, his philosophical leanings? I knew he was liberal, but I also knew that he was a person who was more to the moderate side than the extreme liberal side. And I knew he was very aware that we had a country with diverse opinions, backgrounds, and that you had to reconcile all this. You had mentioned early this afternoon when we began, um, Abner Mikov came up again. And from what I understand, both you and Mikva did play a role where he would come and he would ask for your advice. Well, that was a strange thing because neither Abner nor nor I were aware that the other was helping Brock. Um, we've discovered that later. When Abner finished in the Clinton White House and came home, uh, we saw a lot of each other, but we're not, we're not aware that... Uh, both of us knew Barack. <clears throat> then, later we discovered this, and then when Barack decide, was deciding at the end of 2006 whether he should run for president, I had written an, an op-ed for the Chicago Tribune urging him to run for president. And so he knew what I thought. But he called me and he said, I'd like to have a talk with you and Abner. I'm going to be in Chicago on such and such a day. Can you get Abner to come to your office? I'll come to your office. I'd like to have a talk. So we met with him in my office. I have a wonderful picture that my assistant, Kathy Schultz, took with her iPhone. And... Um, what Barack said basically was this. He was taking his family to Hawaii to make a final decision whether he would run for president. And what was bothering him the most was, if he did this, whether he could be a good father. He said, I know I'll never be home. I've got two young daughters. I'll be gone. I know that each of you has three daughters. They've turned out very well. Uh, do you think I can be a good father? And I said, Brock, I said, uh, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I believe a parent's greatest influence on a child is when they're teenagers, not when they're very small. I said, your kids are still very small. If you get elected, which I doubt, I said, because I thought he could be running for vice president is what I thought. Um, I said, which I doubt. If you get elected, you'll be with your kids all the time because you'll be living above the store. Your kids will be 
like teenagers, and you will have a greater influence on them. And he's writing all writing all this down. I said, "What are you writing? Why are you writing this down?" He said, "I want to tell this to Michelle." I said, "Don't listen to this." I said, "I'm not an expert. I'm not a. This is." He said, "I'm just writing it down." Years later, the last year of his presidency. This is now nine or ten years. Nine years later. I'm reading an interview with Barack in the New York Times on a Sunday. And in it, the questioner was, well, why did you decide to run when you did? He said, well, I decided to run when my children were small because I think the biggest influence on a child is when the ch children are teenagers. And now I live above the store and I can see my kids all the time. And I said to myself, by God, it's stuck. This is nine or ten years later, and this stuck with him in the same words. Well, he should have thrown in a credit for that, he, <laughs> that came from you in Mikvah. <laughs> well, if, between Abner uh, and myself, we have six daughters, five are lawyers, and one is a rabbi. It does sound, that story, though, that the person he had to convince the most, I mean, if you're going to run for president, you can't do this as a half measure. You have to be all in and really, really driven. And Michelle was not there at that time. Okay. Also, she was also, and justifiably, very concerned about his safety. Was that a concern of you as well? Yes. In fact, Abner, I remember Abner at that time specifically said, Brock, if you're going to run, you've got to get your own security around you. Didn't even trust the Secret Service? Well, uh, he started off with his own, and then Senator Durbin, I think there had been some threats. Senator Durbin got him some Secret Service protection very early. Yeah, I can't remember at what stage of a campaign. I think it was very early. That the Secret Service is assigned. That would make sense, yeah. Well, um, how about the financial part of it? Uh, by this time, uh, were you still involved in the campaign, the presidential campaign, in, in late 2006 and 2007? Yes, except because of my role with the Presidential Debates Commission, uh, I could not, either financially or any other way, be deeply involved in the campaign, so I was. Did you offer any advice about how to run an effective campaign? Not really. In fact, no one asked me. In fact, I would have done things a little differently. <laughs> but they knew what they were doing. Well, how would I would have done things differently when he went to the White House. Okay, not so much during the campaign, but in yeah. the White House. Yeah. The heir apparent for the Democrats, I think this is fair to say, for the Democrats in late 2006 would have been Hillary Clinton. Were, is that your assumption, that he would have been vice president and Clinton would have been the president? It could have been, but Hillary had made a ghastly error. Uh, she didn't admit that she was wrong about the Iraq war, whereas Barack had been against the Iraq war from the beginning. And I believe that that was the decisive thing that changed, particularly in the first Iowa caucuses. That was certainly a memorable um, campaign on both sides, both Republicans and Democrats. Before we get there, though, I wonder how closely you were following his career when he was an Illinois state senator. Uh, not really. I did have one idea, and I went to him with it, and it didn't work. <clears throat> I said, this donor of your organs program is very important. And what we do now is ask people when they get a driver's license uh, if they want to be a, a, a donor. We should ask them repeatedly. Not, uh, not Now they ask people when they go in the hospital. That's not the time to ask people that. And what I suggested is when you register to vote, you should be asked if you want to be an organ donor. I wanted them to change the law. 
And Barack thought about it. I don't think it ever happened. Did you have a personal reason for feeling so strongly no, about that? No, but I, I feel very strongly that the um, donating organs is a great lifesaver. I also do not think, I'm also a great believer in letting people choose how they want to die. Well, let's get back to that presidential campaign year of 2004. And you just mentioned the, uh, the Iowa caucus. That's obviously the first place. And it's always an intense lead up to that. And it's anybody's guess of how it's going to turn out. We, I would assume you are following the campaign for that entire year. I, I am. But again, <clears throat> because of the debate commission, I didn't contribute and I didn't go to meetings or campaign in any way. I think the, re the important thing in Iowa was the Iraq war position, particularly for young people, college students, who were against the war and who came out in the caucuses who had never been involved before. Were you surprised by how well uh, candidate Obama seemed to be connecting with the audience? No. Uh, actually, what persuaded me that he should run was one Sunday afternoon, my wife and I were home, and I had C-SPAN on television, and Barack was speaking in Iowa at the, whatever it was, a fish fry or something, that the senator, um, trying to remember his name, he's no longer in office, uh, the senator had every year, and Barack was speaking. Harkin? Harkin. And I watched this on television, and I said to Joe, I said, this is Jack Kennedy all over again. I said, look at that audience. Look at how they're responding to him. This is Jack Kennedy all over again. And that's what I thought. That's when I wrote the piece for the Tribune urging him to run. So he was already on the campaign trail when you wrote the, the article for the Tribune. He was thinking about it. I, this was long before. He didn't decide... He didn't announce his run until the beginning of the next year. I think that was the Harkin thing was in the summer. This would have been summer of 2006. And he made the decision to run, I think, in January of um, seven. And the election campaign was at eight. Okay. I mentioned Hillary Clinton. Born and raised in Chicago. Did you know her? Yes. I knew Hillary because we used to go to Renaissance Weekend every Christmas, and Hillary and Bill were there, and we met them before he became president. Now, you've already— And I like her. Okay, that was my next question. What did you think of her as a— potential candidate, as I, a potential president, I should say. I think she would have been a very good president. I think she was not a good candidate, particularly in 2016, but I think she would have been an excellent president. Okay. It's a bumpy um, primary race on the Democrat side, the Republican side as well, but I think most of the attention that year was on the Democrat side. Uh, towards the middle or late part of that primary race. A couple issues came to the forefront, uh, and one of them was the church that uh, Barack Obama attended here in Chicago. And so I wanted to ask you about how much you knew about his relationship with Jeremiah Wright <clears throat> in that church. I knew nothing, <clears throat> period, nothing. But when it came public, I thought Barack had to get away from that guy as quickly as possible. Do you think he handled it well? I think he did in the end. I would have done it a lot faster. As I recall, the first time he came out, it was in general supportive of, of uh, uh, Pastor Wright, and then he had to back away from that. Well, and then Pastor Wright did an extraordinarily dumb thing in, at the National Press Club uh, where he was going on and on. Uh, and Barack had no choice at that point. I would have divorced uh, Reverend Wright a lot faster. 
The other issue, and this is more in the general campaign, uh, but another one of the issues that the conservative side of the, the Republican Party was especially harping on was an association with uh, uh, Michael Ayers. Do you know anything about that? With who? With Ayers. Did I get the first name wrong? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I, I think that that was a, a very uh, inaccurate. I don't think they were friends at all. I think they lived in the same neighborhood. And I don't think there was any relationship of any consequence there. The uh, Republican candidate is John McCain, who touted himself to be a maverick, and he really built on that whole concept of a maverick. Any comments about that? I have great respect. I know Senator McCain. I have great respect and admiration for him, uh, not only as a war hero. Uh, I like what he's saying about President Trump. Uh, and I like uh, Senator McCain, uh, and I think he made one unforgivable error. I think I might know what it is, but yeah, I'll let was, you mention it. It was picking uh, Palin as his running mate. Alaska Governor Sarah Palin. It was a very, very bad decision. Do you think he ran a credible campaign against uh Candidate Obama. Yes, except I think Palin hurt him a lot. We started this morning talking quite a bit about uh, politics in the 1950s when you were supporting Adlai Stevenson, about uh, your role in the FCC and the nature of television at that time. Now we're talking about 2008. And the world has changed as far, as far as how presidential campaigns are covered. You've got the internet, you've got cable television, you've got talk radio. I wonder if you can reflect a little bit about how politics has changed because of all of that. Politics has suffered greatly by the proliferation uh, of competitive news media. Uh, which are all trying to shouting uh, extremist views. And what's the worst thing that's happened is we used to have a common set of facts where people got the started from the same facts and drew their own conclusions. And now we're arguing about facts all the time. You know, the, Pat Moynihan said it all in one sentence. He said, this is a free country. Everybody's entitled to their own opinions but not to their own facts. And what's happened is everybody's got their own facts now. They don't believe the same things. Well, the conservative critique of that comment would be that who gets to decide what are the facts? Uh, I understand that. And um, I think the answer is that common sense, common sense rather than ideology, decides what the facts are. But currently, ideology decides what the facts are. Well, have, having kind of broached the subject myself, a couple of the other issues that raise their head, I mean, obviously, race is always going to be an issue when you have something like this. Uh, but a couple of the issues is questions about uh, candidate Obama's uh, nationality, whether he was born in the United States, and also questions about his religion. Um, care to, to reflect on either of those? Well, I've wondered why uh, President Obama was hesitant to release his birth certificate. I would have done it much faster. I don't know why. That was well after the election. Yeah. Uh, I would have done it uh, much faster. As far as his religion is concerned, um, it seems to me he is a Christian without question, and that, why that should even be attacked, I don't un, uh, understand. Where I differ somewhat is on a different issue. I think American elections, the la take the last uh, eight or nine elections, they're decided by a hair. If you, it's usually two points, three points, one point, less than one point. If you could take 10 people who exactly reflected the electorate 
and bring him into the White House for a meeting. And you wanted it to be exactly conforming to the election results. You'd have to take one person and cut him into pieces. You, you wouldn't, you, it's not six and four, it's five and three quarters against, it, our elections are very close. The result means we have a divided country. And what I would do, if I were, about, the minute I got, if I were elected president, the first thing I would do is get my campaign staff to go over to the Democratic National Committee, and I would bring a bipartisan, a bipartisan group of advisors into the White House, because that's what you're dealing with today. Would they be able to find a bipartisan group of advisors anymore? Well, in history, in American history, uh, look what Lincoln did uh, uh, with the Doris Carnes book, great book, The Team of Rivals. I think we tend to bring partisanship. Uh, uh, we've certainly got it in Illinois today uh, as a classic example of a failure of, of bringing bipartisanship together. Today, if you believe the public opinion polls, more people say, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican, I'm an independent. They outnumber those people who say, I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican. The country is sick and tired of this bitter, bitter partisanship, and no politician seems to be able to surmount it. That takes us back to the 2008 election where during the general election, Barack Obama seemed to find that magic of really appealing to lots of different people across lines. Exactly, but, when, but after that, it didn't work out that way. I'm uh, very positive about that. I, I have a good friend of Don Rumsfeld. We were friends for many, many years. And when Nixon was leaving the White House, and it looked like Jerry Ford was going to become president. I knew that Don was close to Ford. So I called Don. I said, I've got a big idea. Can I have two minutes on the phone? He said, you've got a big idea. You can have two hours. What's the idea? I said, Jerry Ford is going to become the president. He should go on television. He should say, I'm the first president of the United States who was never elected president or vice president. We've got an unprecedented situation here. I've asked the senior Democrat in the Senate, Senator Mansfield, to be my vice president. Senator Mansfield and I promise we will not run for office at the next election. Instead, we're going to run a bipartisan government and we're going to unite this country. I don't hear anything on the phone. I thought we were disconnected. I said, hello, hello. And Don says, I heard you. I said, well, what do you think? He says, do you know Jerry Ford? I said, I've met him. I don't. He said, he's never going to do that. I said, tell him. I think this was what the country needs. I, I believe that. And um, I just think we have to have an op whatever opportunities we have to get rid of this current bitter, bitter partisanship. we got to do it. Franklin Roosevelt managed to do it when he did with Senator Vandenberg during World War II. And he changed his vice presidential candidate yes, in he did. 19, 1944 and brought in Harry Truman. Yes. Well, going back to Jerry Ford, what he thought was necessary to, to get beyond the Watergate years was to pardon Richard Nixon. What do you think about that? I think he did the right thing, but he didn't explain it properly. Yeah. And later, years later, I, my wife and I were invited to the Ford Library. This was after he lost. And I said, uh, President Ford, you know, he knew me from the debate commission. And um, or at that time, illegal women voters. I said, Mr. President, or thank you very much for participating in the debates. You're the first incumbent president to participate in the debates. He said, I think the debates help me. He said, when I entered the debates, I was 33 points behind. Everybody thinks because I made that remark about Poland that I lost the election in the debates. He said, the debates helped me. When, I, when the election time came, I lost it by hair. 
He said, I think the debates helped me. I'm a a great admirer of President Ford. Well, I didn't expect to be talking about Jerry Ford in this, but that's one of the delightful parts of doing these interviews. Let's go back to Barack Obama's 2008 campaign, and we've been talking about that already quite a bit, but how well do you think he did during the general campaign of running that campaign? Excellent. I think it was brilliant, and I give a lot of credit to my friend David Axelrod for figuring it out. Another Chicagoan. Yes. Did you have a chance to go? Oh, one question before that. Your mood then election night? Uh, I thought it would be close. Uh, And we did not go to the uh, ceremony here at Grant Park. We watched it on television with tears in our eyes. I can imagine that might have been you were in your 80s by that time. Yes. Did right. you did you go to the inauguration? Yes, we did, and we were invited. Or we were treated uh, like family and friends at the inauguration. Saw the president several times, and um, I cried a lot. I thought. My God, what a thing, particularly having known him and seeing for the first time in American history a black candidate becoming the president. Were a lot of your emotions tied to that that significant first, that he was an African-American being yes. elected president? Yes. Did that work out as well as you had hoped? Yes and no. I thought when he was elected that every black child in America would say, wow, there's no limit to what I can accomplish. It has not worked out that way. And I think, unfortunately, racism is still with us, and it's still a major problem in the United States. This is... 150 or plus years after the Civil War. Yeah, I've got a few more questions about uh, his administration, but before we do that, I wanted to ask you about, I would imagine one of the more, you've gotten lots of awards and recognition during your life, but one of the more important ones to you is the Presidential Medal of Freedom that you got just this last year. It's the most important award because and particularly because it was given to me by President Obama. Who else was in the group with you? Well, it was amazing. There was Tom Hanks and Bruce Springsteen and Michael Jordan and uh, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates. And um, I mean, it was just extraordinary. There were also the, had one funny experience. I, you were seated alphabetically, and I was seated next to Lorne Michaels, the producer of Saturday Night Live. And I said, Mr. Michaels, it's a pleasure to meet you, but I've got some bad news for you. He said, what's that? I said, I'm on the Presidential Debate Commission. From now on, Saturday Night Live is going to pay us royalties because we give you your best material. He said, we couldn't afford it. (laughs) (laughs) I got to ask you this then. Would Saturday Night Live represent the best of what television can become? Sometimes it's just terrific. Sometimes it's terrible. Sometimes it would belong in the vast wasteland. Yes. (laughs) As they say, my favorite line in the movie, you remember Some Like It Hot, when um, Joey Brown proposes marriage to... Oh, yes. Jack Lemon, And she says, we can't marry you. She said, I'm, I'm not a woman. And he said, well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Classic movie, too. Okay. Well, then, the Obama administration. Eight years. Um, obviously, for the entire time frame he's in office, we're fighting the uh, war on terror. I want to have you give your assessment of his administration, and let's start domestically, if you will. Well, he did a historic thing by 
enabling everybody in America to have health care. That's the bill is legislation is a long way from being perfect, but the principle, the basic point being that nobody should be deprived of health care in this country is correct. And so that's what I think he'll be remembered for domestically the most. There are many other good things, but I think that'll head the list. And on the international stage? On the national stage, we didn't get in any more wars. Uh, I think I would have, if it were my choice, I would have gotten everybody, all, all Americans, out of Iraq and out of Afghanistan. Uh, I wouldn't have kept anybody there. Those were two mistakes that started before him. Uh, but you get to inherit your predecessor's mistakes. Do. And many, obviously, the conservatives would say that because we pulled out as quickly as we did in Iraq, that that allowed for the emergence of ISIS. Uh, I know that. And uh, I think our efforts against ISIS have got to be uh, redoubled and quadrupled, and we've got to deal with that. North Korea, I think, as I understand it, President Obama told President, incoming President Trump, that was the most serious thing facing the country. I think that's true. Uh, but overall, I, I give the, the, the President Obama's administration very high marks, except that I would have pushed more for bipartisanship. You mean reaching out to the yeah. Congress more than he yes, did? Yes, yes. Are you still in touch with the, the Obamas? Not, uh, well, just recently he came to Chicago to a dinner we were invited to, and I couldn't go, so I sent him an email, and then he saw my daughter uh, at the Harvard event. He said, your dad sent me an email to uh, tell, me, tell me I understand perfectly. So I haven't talked to him lately. I would like to very much. I'd like to have a chance in a leisurely, non-rushed way to, to do that. Are you excited about having a presidential library here in Chicago? Very much so, and I think it'll be an enormous contribution to life in our city, too. Are you going to be involved in that in any way? Nobody's asked me so far. I'm sure we'll be uh, contributing to it. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, that I, I have a friend, uh, Bob Wedgworth, who was head of the American Library Association, the first African-American to hold that job and a great librarian. He used to be the librarian at the University of Illinois. Uh, I've gotten him involved. And uh, I think that um, I was the lawyer for the American Library Association for years. I think that the library will, with all the new media, with the new social media, it will be more than just a building. It'll be a big international uh, communications hub. And we were talking earlier, I understand that you have a connection with the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Museum as my well. My wife does, and my wife was a trustee, early trustee of the Abraham Lincoln Library Foundation. She's an honorary life member now. Your impressions of that institution? Very important. It's sh shocking to me that it took all these years for uh, President Lincoln to have a library. And I think people, uh, I, I tell everybody who has children, to take their children to Springfield to see that. It's, in, it's, it's, it's inspiring. Okay. We were talking just about the Presidential Library for uh, President Obama coming here to Chicago. What keeps bringing you back to the city? Well, I love the city. People uh, who've studied it say that Chicago is the most American of all the cities in the United States. And I think there's a lot of truth in that because we've got every nationality, every uh, race, uh, every uh, uh, diverse part of America right here in this city, the great uh, spirit of Chicago. Uh, I have lived here since World War II when I 
got out of the Army. Uh, we've got great institutions here. Uh, we unfortunately, uh, uh, with the, I, I, I'm absolutely uh, against the way we treat guns in this country and that everybody, uh, we have so much killing and shooting here and the ones who suffer the most are the African-American community as a result. We've got to deal with that. Our, the other part is I think everything depends on our schools. Uh, some years ago, Chicago Magazine interviewed Chicagoans about what was most important in Chicago, and I said the schools. As a result, the principal of a school in a terrible neighborhood in Chicago a bilingual his, Latino Hispanic school came to see me and said, "All right, big shot, you want to do something? You'll, you'll adopt our school." Well, I got our firm to do that. That was 30 years ago. We've done it. And for my 90th birthday, the Canoon School had a party for me and asked me to come there. And I said to the principal. Anybody who went to school here as a student when we adopted the school ever come back as a teacher? And she said, just a minute. She brought a young woman over to me. She said, Mr. Minow, I was in first grade when you first came here. Wow. It had to make you feel like there is a special connection there. Yes. It's it's a city of contrast, isn't it? I mean, you mentioned that before, but the downtown area is so vibrant and alive when you come here. It's such a great place for tourists to visit. Well, they say it's, it's like a tale of two cities. I was very involved helping John Bryan build Millennium Park. It turned out to be far more successful than, than we thought of the time. This is a great city and and it's a I love being here. And you got the pier right out our window. You can yeah. look at the Chicago Pier. Well here's a crucial question for anybody from Chicago. Cubs or White Sox? Cubs, absolutely the Cubs. We're a huge Cubs fan. Uh, my dad used to bring my brother and me to see the Cubs when we were a little children. We used to drive up from Milwaukee. And I knew one day they would win the World Series. And we loved to see it. It took a practically miraculous game to do it, though, didn't it? It was very exciting. I think they had that little break in the rain. For a a rain moment. delay, and, yes. And I think that's, that saved them. Is a Chicago, is the city a good place for a young lawyer to start a career? I think it is. I think it's a great place. Uh, and I think that we have uh, a, a very good, not perfect, but a very good judicial system, particularly in the federal courts. We've got a lot of people now in the, uh, in the st state judges. I have a number of friends who have become judges and uh, are Im important. We've got a very active bar association. Uh, our, my senior partner at that time at Austin was very involved when there was a scandal at the Illinois Supreme Court. And two justices had to resign because of the pressure from the, from the bar. Uh, so this is, I think we can be very proud. I'm curious about your connection with Singapore. Uh, that was in many ways an accident, but it's something I'm very proud of. <clears throat> Our firm opened an office in Singapore about 30 years ago, and I went there. I was involved in managing the firm, and I met the, um, the equivalent of the Secretary of the Treasury. He was uh, very close to uh, Lee Kuan Yew, the Prime Minister, and we struck up a friendship and he said, uh, we have a little problem here. We wonder if you could help us. What it was, they wanted somebody to put some money into Singapore Airlines, the best uh, airline probably in the world, but who wouldn't change anything the way they were doing. 
but we helped them with that. As a result, we established a professional relationship. And then years later, there was a very critical article about Singapore in the New York Times Magazine saying that uh, it was not as democratic or as free as it should be. And I wrote with my partner then, Mark Engels, wrote a response saying, what was the United States like when it started? Was slavery okay? Were women treated okay? I mean, democracy evolves. Singapore did not become an independent nation until after World War II. And it's done remarkably, remarkably well. Well, as a result, they asked me if I'd become the Consul General here in Chicago, which I did. Is that an honorary position for it's you? It's an honorary position. I'm just giving it up this week, after 16 years. Yeah. A little bittersweet, I would think. Well, it, it, they gave, Singapore honored me. It gave me the equivalent of the Medal of Freedom, <laughs> the Singapore uh, Medal, which was I'm very proud of. Well, outstanding. It's amazing how these things happen in people's lives. And it's kind of one of the things I wanted to turn to next here is turning points in your own life. Now, I'd imagine that many veterans look at their experiences in, in war as a turning point. Did you see that as, as the case? Uh, definitely. Uh, I think the war changed me. <clears throat> I was lucky not to be where a number of my fellow battalion members where they were in the jungle with disease and terror. I was at headquarters, which was a safe place. <clears throat> My wife loves the story of what happened to me there. I was running a switchboard, which was important because you connected India, Burma, and China. One day I made a mistake. I disconnected somebody. And the voice came on and said, you disconnected me. And I said, I'm very sorry, sir. He said, do you know who this is? I said, no. I said, I don't, sir. He said, this is Commander Louis Mountbatten, Commander in Chief. Of, we were under British command. Then. And I said, oh my God, what have I done? I, I, said, I said, do you know who this is? And the voice said, no. I said, good, and I disconnected everybody. And we started all over again. Uh, but I was, uh, that was an eye-opener for me, for not only to be in that part of the world, to get an exposure to that, but I learned a lot about the different people in the Army. I was exposed to people, different views, different backgrounds. I, I strongly believe there should be national oblig obligatory public service some form of this country. Another turning point I would imagine you would readily agree with is when you became uh, chairman of the FCC. How did that experience change the trajectory of your life? Well, I realized uh, <clears throat> for the I was a kid. I was 34 years old. Uh, but I realized how important television was and how the country was not benefiting to me as it should from from this extraordinary gift. This, and I wanted them to do more news and more public service time and not charge politicians for selling time. I wanted to do, I accomplished some of it, not all of it. But I realized what a gift I was given by President Kennedy to have that responsibility. And I, what I'm particularly proud of, as I think back about it, are two things. One, the, 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 I was right in saying that we can beat the Russians with this communication satellite technology, and we did. And second, that we now have PBS, public radio, all throughout this country, which children, Sesame Street, things like that, I'm very proud of that. You mentioned Bill and Melinda Gates. This might be a bit of a stretch, but that telecommunication connection and how the world has changed just in the last 20 years because of those satellites, because of the way we now can communicate with each other. Nobody 
foresaw what an what an implication this would would have. Uh, and uh, as I said, I testified 13 times in the Congress about it. One day, I remember the Senator Long from Louisiana said to me, he said, uh, Chairman Minow, he said, you say this is the one area where we could beat the Russians. What do you suggest we do so we can beat the Russians? I said, we could get the Russians to adopt the Administrator Procedures Act. That would tie up their bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out they had a worse bureaucracy than, than we did. We didn't know it. But I was so frustrated at that time with the, how complicated our political system was. It had to deal 13 times in the Senate, fight with the Department of Justice, fight with every, to get something done in this country is hard. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned your three daughters a couple of times. I'll give you an opportunity to brag about them here a little bit. Well, we have three extraordinary daughters and three extraordinary grandchildren. We have my oldest daughter, Nell, who is a uh, University of Chicago trained lawyer, is a shareholder activist. In fact, she's known throughout the country as the, one of the leading uh, activists in corporate governance. And she's also a writer and a film critic, a uh, very respected film critic. My middle daughter is a scholar. Uh, she is currently, for another couple of weeks, the dean at Harvard Law School. And she's the first dean at Harvard Law School in 200 years not to go to Harvard Law School. She went to Yale Law School. She keeps that a secret. Uh, my third daughter, Mary, also a lawyer, Stanford Law School, she is working on a very exciting thing right now. She's a librarian as well as a lawyer. And she thinks libraries can be a very effective answer to fake news. So she is working with the American Library Association at the Berkman Digital Center at Harvard and with Facebook on an idea called Check It Out where you're watching something on social media, you're not sure if it's right or wrong, where you will have four or five choices to check it out, including a public library. And uh, so those are the three girls. Then I have a, a, my oldest grandson is a teacher at a public school in Brooklyn. My uh, second oldest granddaughter is a costume designer in Hollywood, she worked on Mad Men and a bunch of other oh, boy. program. Yeah. And my <clears throat> third uh, granddaughter is a writer. She's already written two or three books and is working on others. She is a fantasy writer about uh, fiction in a, in a fantasy world. But they're all three very good, wonderful people. Does it make you step back when you realize your daughter is retiring now? My son-in-law <laughs> has retired. Um, the years slip by. And I, and I still go to the office. Uh, well, I was lucky, and I met my wife at a very opportune time in life. She's she's been sensational, and she was she's a very active trustee of the Chicago History Museum and of the uh, the Abraham Lincoln Library, and of the God, she's a great music lover, and with the um, uh, symphony and with the Ravinia and with Council on Global Affairs. So we've had a very active life. And I've had wonderful law partners. Uh, my one partner, Howard Trenans, and I have been together since law school. Uh, that's a long time. 60 plus years? Close to 70. Amazing. We've talked a lot about your accomplishments, the things that you're proud of that you accomplished while you were chairman of the FCC. What other things in your life are you especially proud of? Most of all, my family. I would say. And I love, I mean, I was blessed to be born in America. 
uh, they have a chance to be a citizen of their greatest country. Uh, to I've known nine presidents. Personally. Personally. I've uh, served uh, Republicans and Democrats. Um, uh, president Bush, first President Bush, when the first Iraq war ended, there was a big debate in the country, should women serve in military combat? And there was a big argument in Congress about it. And the president appointed a bipartisan commission to study that question and appointed me. I was a Democratic member of that. Um, and in the second Bush administration, not the president, but Don Rumsfeld was Secretary of Defense. He called me, and I headed a major commission for the Department of Defense on the issue of privacy, how to protect privacy when we were doing all these internet intercepts. And I served on that. Boy, that's ripped out of right of today's headlines. Yes, it is. And we had a very important effect that affected Congress. Um, so I, I was, I have to tell you one story about President Reagan. Uh, when I was chairman of PBS, <clears throat> President Reagan invited some public broadcasters in. I'll never forget this. And he, well, there was just a few of us. My wife was with me. And he said, you know, he said, I'm very interested in what you're doing. But I leave tomorrow at 6 in the morning to meet with Gorbachev. And I've been given six huge loose-leaf books by my staff. I have to master them before we go. So I've only got about 15 minutes. But as long as you're here, he said, there's a story I want to tell Gorbachev. But my staff says I shouldn't. So I'm going to tell it to you, and I want you to tell me if you think I should tell it to Gorbachev. So he said, fine. So he says, there's a citizen in Moscow who desperately wants to own a car. He's worked all his life, 45 years, and saved all his money, and he's told that if he goes to a secret, secret, secret office in the sub, 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 basement of the Kremlin, with the money, he'll be able to get a car. So he takes all his money, he goes to this office, and the commissar says, Comrade, what do you want? He says, I want to buy a car. He says, have you got the money? He says, yes. He says, put the money on the, they will count the money, they count the money. They say, commissar, uh, Comrade, congratulations, you're going to be able to have a car. He says, wonderful. He says, what do I do? He says, well, you come back to this office. Ten years from today. So the comrade says, ten years from today. He says, should I come in the morning or should I come in the <laughs> afternoon? And the commissar, such a silly question. It's ten years from now, you're asking, you should come in the morning or the afternoon. And the commissar says, not a silly question. He said, would you come in? He, he said, the plumber, the, co the comrade says, the plumber is coming in the morning. <laughs> so we said, tell the story. And he did. We learned later that he told the story to Gorbachev. Gorbachev didn't like it. <laughs> but that was Reagan. And Reagan restored confidence in the country. And Reagan loved public broadcasting. Yeah. The great communicator had that reputation. So we begin and we close with that subject. It, it, looking back in a, on a long career, what do you think your you would like to have your legacy be? Well, I think I'd like to be um, that he loved uh, his family, loved his country, and he tried to contribute to it. Well, Mr. Minow, you're definitely going to have an important place in American textbooks and history books and in a very positive light. So 
I'll give you an opportunity to finish off with any other reflections you have today, but we're about done. Well, I think I, I, I repeat about how lucky I've been to, uh, very often to be in the right place at the right moment and to uh, uh, take advantage of that. Uh, I worry a lot about the country's future, but I think that the as I've gotten older, <clears throat> I realize how wise the founders of this country were and the way they distributed power uh, with the checks and balances system and how resilient uh, as a nation uh, we can be. And still be an inspiration for much of the rest of the world. I think that's our role and I think we will be. Any final comments then, Mr. Minnell? No, I'm very grateful for this opportunity, Mark. Uh, you've asked very searching questions. It got me to reflect. And um, uh, I hope this will be helpful to somebody someday. It will be one of the things that we are most proud to add our collection. We've got three institutions involved, but it's been my great honor to have a chance to get to know you a little bit better and to hear these stories firsthand, because not only are they fascinating, but it's part of America's fabric of history. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us.